Welcome to the Giving Voice to Depression podcast, produced in partnership with the A.B. Corker Foundation for Mental Health. We are your co-hosts, Bridget and Terry. Each week, through intimate, candid conversations with guests, we explore different perspectives on and experiences of depression. We keep it real because the illness is real. We keep it hopeful because there truly is hope in spite of what depression tells you. We are not experts or therapists. We're sisters and best friends who live with depression and have interviewed hundreds of others who do as well. By sharing stories of lived experiences, we expose depression for the lying bully that it is. Please listen to one of our favorite episodes from our archive this week. Hello, Bridget. Hi, Terry. Since we post on social media daily, we also read the posts of other mental health advocates every day and frequently repost those that resonate with us or that we think other people in the Giving Voice to Depression community would appreciate, learn from, or take comfort in. For example, Dr. Glenn Doyle on Instagram recently wrote, The best minds in mental health are not the docs. They're the trauma survivors who've had to figure out how to stay alive for years with virtually no help. Want to learn how to psychologically survive under unfathomable stress, he asks? Talk to abuse survivors. Mm. Just yesterday, we saw another Sinclair P. Caesar III's Instagram post. He says... My therapist taught me to interrupt my anxious thoughts with thoughts like, what if things work out? Or what if all of my hard work pays off? I'm passing this on to you, wherever you are, whatever you're leaving, and whomever you are becoming. Fleur de Lis Speaks posted a handwritten note that says, this week I will do my best and surrender the rest. I will celebrate what I'm able to accomplish and give myself grace for what is left undone. I will begin each day with gratitude for the opportunity to try again. Oh my gosh, I love that. Grace for what is left undone. Mm -hmm. And what all of these posts have in common is that they reflect a level of understanding that comes from first-person experience, peer support. They're not trite bumper stickers about everything turning easily and permanently better. That's not life, and it's certainly not life with depression or suicidal thoughts. Today's guest, Sam Dylan Finch, who we first interviewed three years ago, brings the insight of being both a suicide attempt and suicide loss survivor. When we read his post, 10 Ways to Reach Out When You're Struggling with Your Mental Health, on his blog, Let's Queer Things Up, we knew we had to help spread his practical, hard-earned wisdom and advice. In this episode, we'll discuss the first five of his suggestions, and next week, Sam's sixth through tenth suggestions. Here is Sam Dylan Finch giving his voice to depression. Sam is a mental health writer. He freely and articulately shares about his challenges in articles that stress the importance of vulnerability, defying stigma, speaking up, and speaking out. So when his close friend died by suicide earlier this year, he was gutted. I guess I kind of thought, like, as a mental health advocate, as someone who's really public about what I've struggled with, um, I had always just assumed that people close to me would just magically know that they could reach out to me. But in the time following that loss, Sam realized something that helped him better understand. I found myself becoming really, really caught up in that grief and finding myself having my own thoughts of suicide. Um, I'm an attempt survivor, so suicidality is nothing new to me. But I found myself in those few weeks not really asking for help either. And I started to wonder, why did I find it so difficult? And why did I place this expectation on my friend to reach out when I was having a hard time doing the same thing? It's so easy to say, let the experts handle it. That's what therapists are for. But they're not always a timely option. Honestly, you know, our loved ones are usually the first line of defense when someone's struggling with their mental health because we have a mental health system, at least in the U.S., where trying to get any kind of therapy or psychiatry appointment can be a really, really lengthy and difficult process. 
So if we're waiting on clinicians to be the ones that are able to step in, we're waiting far, far too long for folks who need help sooner rather than later. So Sam used his grief, experience, and perspective to make a list that he wishes both he and his friend had had. Sam writes, I don't know if an article like this could have saved my friend, but what I do know is that we need to normalize asking for help and talking about what that might look like rather than pretending it's a simple and intuitive thing to do. So, if you're struggling and need some help, here's some specific ways to ask for it. The first suggestion on Sam's list is to say, I'm, whatever you are, depressed, anxious, suicidal. I'm not sure what to ask for, but I don't want to be alone. Sometimes the biggest obstacle is that people really don't know what they need. And the expectation that people should when they're in such a dark space is really like asking someone who doesn't know how to swim, like you throw them in the water and you're like, I don't know, just swim. And so allowing people to just name that, say, I don't know what I need. And to just express like, I'm not sure what to ask for, but I do know that I don't want to do this alone can be really, really powerful and letting loved ones know. Yeah, I'm a little lost right now, but just having you here with me is important to me. It's actually beautiful. Mm. If someone said that to me, you know, I, I would so be there. And, and I could see myself saying it to someone, but I, I never in my entire life have. Right. And we don't see it modeled. I can't think of a time when someone said that to me. Mm-hmm. But I do know that if someone did, I would be there in a heartbeat. I think it's just finding those words can be so difficult. Thankfully, Sam is giving us those words today. A second way to reach out is to say, I'm struggling with my mental health, and what I've been trying isn't working. Can we, again, then ask for what you need, meet up, Skype, whatever, on a specific date, and come up with a better plan? This one I knew had to be on the list, just because the system is still so, so complicated. And I've watched so many people that I love try to figure it out when it's too late, you know? when they're already so depressed and things are just so dysfunctional that asking them to make phone call after phone call, set up appointments, figure out meal plans, or even like trying to figure out how to get an apartment cleaner, like so many little things that have to be put together like a puzzle to to really get any kind of progress going, that I realize that there's no reason why that can't be a team approach. And setting a specific time to team up is key. Oh, that's so important. Um, setting a specific time, I think, performs a couple of functions. The first is so that the person you're talking to understands that this isn't something you're asking for a month from now or like whenever, that it's an urgent ask, that there's the stakes are there, that people understand that this is important. And also I think it's helpful for the person who's struggling to just know like, okay, things are really cruddy right now, but I do know that on Wednesday night, I'm meeting up with X friend and we're going to come up with a plan. It makes it a little bit easier to hang in there because you know that there's a point in the future in which there's going to be some kind of progress made. Number three, I don't feel safe by myself right now. Can you stay on the phone with me or come over until I calm down? I think most people find it really difficult to say, you know, I don't feel safe right now. But it's also a really important moment to reach out and just figuring out how to assemble those words together. The reason I kind of framed it the way that I did was because I wanted people to understand the urgency. So loved ones should know that you don't feel safe. But also giving a direct ask, can you stay on the phone with me or can you come over until I calm down? Helps people understand like this is what I need right now. Rather than just saying like, I don't feel safe, fix it. Because not everyone is really equipped to deal with a crisis. I think that's a direct enough ask that people feel more empowered to be able to help because they're not just being thrown into a situation where they don't know what to do. Sam's fourth suggestion for reaching out is to say, I'm in a bad place, but I'm not ready to talk about it. Can you help me distract myself? I think there's this misconception that you shouldn't ask for help if you don't want to talk about what you're going through. But what that often means is I think of the like leaky pipe in the basement analogy where people wait until their basement is flooded before they actually get help as opposed to like fixing things where they start. 
um, in a similar way. Like if you're not ready to talk about whatever's bothering you, or if in general you just tend to be a more private person, there really should be some kind of language available to people that articulate that. This is such important and unfamiliar language that we asked Sam to say it again. You do not have to be ready to talk about your trauma or your suicidality to be able to reach out to someone and get some support. It's okay to say, I'm not ready, but I would like some kind of distraction or some kind of support or some kind of connection that helps me, at least in this moment, deal with what I'm dealing with. And those distractions will be as individual as the person asking. We've heard from a number of our podcast guests that something that occupies your mind without stressing it is good, whether that's watching an engaging show, doing a puzzle, or playing a game. Sam cautions against thinking of whatever it is as something to make you happy, which may be unrealistic under the circumstances. Because obviously if you're depressed, you might think, oh, I shouldn't even bother with self-care. Nothing's going to make me happy. But when you realize that nourishing yourself or, you know, whatever synonym there works for you, whether it's moving towards wellness or doing something that is caring, a caring gesture towards yourself, that's like a much more pragmatic goal to have in mind. I think a lot of the language around self-care doesn't necessarily serve people who have pervasive mental health problems that, like, let's be real, you can't always just like perk yourself up by doing some yoga. So it's nice to have. (laughs) A different framework, as much as I love yoga. Mm -hmm. And Sam's last tip for this episode, number five, is to say, can you check in with me on a specific day or every day if you need it, just to make sure I'm all right? He says, if you take nothing else away from these tips today, it should be to ask people to check in with you. One thing that intimidates people when they're thinking about reaching out for help is that they don't want to ask too much of people. So it can be anything from send me a selfie every day just to check in and be nice to see your face or let's text each other every morning or every evening to see, you know, what our plans are, how we're going to take care of ourselves or it doesn't even have to be a big dramatic thing. Your response to the check in doesn't have to be either. Even if it's as simple as just saying, like, I'm sad. That's how my day is going, because even that gives you some element of being seen. And I think that's a big part of what makes a mental health crisis so toxic is day in and day out of not being seen and not being recognized when you're struggling really can be its own kind of source of trauma because you start to feel invisible. And there's another huge and valuable benefit to the check-in. And the article, I describe it as like buckling your seatbelt when you get into a car. It's like one extra line of defense if things do start to get really difficult Um, people won't hear about it at the last possible minute. They'll have a sense of what's coming because you've been checking in with them, hopefully, and staying connected. And sustaining a connection is such a big part of staying mentally well, or at least survival. Um, Isolating yourself is really one of the worst things you can do, I think, in a mental health crisis. I found myself exhaling as I heard these, you mm. know, it was like he was giving me permission to not know. He was giving me permission and a, a life skill and a life saving skill of learning how to ask for help. Mm-hmm. And to have your own boundaries, to have a specific ask and to feel you're deserving of making an ask. So it's a, a strange thing to think that we might need permission to ask for what we need, but we're certainly not. At least, you know, we weren't taught to ask for it. No, we weren't taught to ask for it. You know, I use that word unresourced over and over again, because Mm -hmm. when I'm in it, you know, I don't have the answers. I don't know what the answers are. I don't know where to look for the answers. I don't even want to look for the answers, you know. Might not have the questions, Bridget. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I love Sam's analogy of waiting um, too long while the basement fills up and is Mm -hmm. completely flooded. Mm -hmm. Because that requires a bigger ask then. Oh my gosh, yes. I feel like getting more attuned to the subtleties that I'm going in that direction. In other words, that I need help Mm -hmm. before I get in that flooded basement Mm -hmm. is something that I try to kind of refine and get a little more... um, subtle with, if that's the right word. Mm -hmm. Tuned in to, certainly. So we'll have Sam's other five next week, and then we will be posting a link to the entire list, as well as his blog, on both our Facebook community page and on our website, givingvoicetodepression.com.
help us spread the word because the more people that hear this information are going to be able to use it. And it is. It's an extra line of defense when you most need it. Mm -hmm. And it can be applied to any number of crises, not just mental health. So it's great information all around. Thank you so much, Sam. And we look forward to hearing more from you next week. We truly hope that our podcast brings a little more understanding, helps you better articulate your experience of depression, or better understand how to support someone else's. We invite you to join us for daily posts on the Giving Voice to Depression Facebook page and on Twitter and Instagram at Voice Depression. It is a comfort to be among fellow travelers on Depression's Dark Road. And remember, if you're struggling, speak up. If someone else is, listen up.